First Kings chapter 7. I've entitled our message tonight, A Heart for God. And we've been looking at Solomon, David's son, who has built a temple for God. Uh, a temple because the uh, presence of the Lord, the Ark of the Covenant, and all of that have been dwelling in a tabernacle, in a tent. And uh, Solomon was the one God chose uh, because he was a man of peace to build a temple for him. And so God is, God is really concerned, by the way, that we would be people of peace. See, that's the ones God wants to use. The, 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 the men and women that God wants to use are those who all are, are all about making peace, not keeping peace. There's a complete difference. I teach this all the time. There is a difference between being a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. A peacekeeper says, ooh, I don't want to say anything because I don't want to upset them. Well, you're really not helping them to be at peace with God if you know that there's something wrong and you're not at peace with them because inside, you know, you need to be confronting them. But a peacemaker says, listen, I want to come and confront you because I want to make peace between you and God and I want to make peace between you and I. So God is concerned with those who are peacemakers. And, and so in this situation, we have Solomon. He is a man of peace. He's not a man of war. That was his daddy. And so he has completed the, the building of God's temple, a temple for the Lord. And now we move on. So let's look at 1 Kings chapter, uh, 1 Kings chapter 7, starting in verse 1. But Solomon took 13 years to build his house, so he finished all his house. Now, interesting. The end, if you look back at, at chapter 6, the very last sentence says, so he was seven years in building it. Building what? Building the tabernacle for God. Uh, excuse me, building the temple for God. So he took seven years to build a house for God, but he took 13 years to build a house for himself. Now, some have hinted that this could reveal Solomon's priorities beginning to change, putting more of a priority on himself. Um, one commentator said this, it does show a place which his own personal comfort and luxurious taste has come to occupy in the life of Solomon. It is often by such simple, unexpected tests that the deepest facts of a human life or revealed. Now, although uh, this truth uh, plagues many in America, especially in America today, why? So many Americans, because we are so privileged, are more concerned about taking care of their own wants and desires more than they are concerned with taking care of God's house and God's concerns. And so I could see where a commentator would draw this conclusion. Now, real quick, I don't know how many of you saw this, uh, but let me just ask, how many of you saw the Inside Edition interview with Kenneth Copeland about his airplanes? Oh, good. Goody. Okay. I'm going to show it to you right now. And there's a reason. It's a little longer it's a little longer than, than the, the uh, videos that I normally show, but I really want you to pay attention to this. Now, real quick, I also happened to see the, uh, the conversation between Kenneth Copeland and Jesse Duplantis when they were talking about their planes. They each have really, really luxurious, luxurious planes. And Kenneth Copeland said to Jesse Duplantis that he couldn't, fly on commercial because he couldn't stand to get in the, that cockpit, or excuse me, into that uh, tube. He called it a tube with a bunch of demons. <laughs> okay? I, I saw the interview where he said that. Now, watch this video as Inside Edition kind of hold his feet to the fire. Watch. There's a commercial.
Hello? Okay. You'll have to go and watch it on your own. But it's interesting because at one point, and, and here's the thing that breaks my heart, folks. At one point, um, he literally gets in her face angrily and puts his finger like that. And then he realizes he's on TV and he kind of calms down. And at the end of it, he prays for her. And I saw a bunch of Christian friends saying how awesome it was that he stood up for his rights. And I'm thinking, I don't know if you saw the same video that I did. It was heartbreaking because she asked some good questions. Listen, I don't think there's anything wrong with having wealth. That's not the problem. But as a pastor, it's ridiculous when you're spending tens of millions of dollars on an airplane. And uh, later on, and there's another re uh, report where he has multiple. He doesn't just have one. He has several. I mean, how many do you need? Okay, let's, let's say for once, okay, he needs one. Okay, then get one. And I don't think he does need one. I, I really, he can fly the same place for $300. And, and by the way, every time they fly, it's like $14,000 to fly. The fueling, the, 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 the captain and all this stuff, it's like $14,000 to fly besides what he spends on the plane. And that's donor money that's going towards that. He has he has an airport in back of his house, his own airport, to land his planes in the back of his house. I, I, you know, I just think that is not a godly, op, uh, it's, it's just not godly, okay? Um, that's not a heart for God. And so here in this commentary, uh, some believe that Solomon, in spending seven years to build God's house, and then he spent... 13 years to build his house, that he was more focused on himself. I disagree with that. I don't think that's what the scripture is trying to tell us. Yes, later on, Solomon will be definitely very fleshy as he accumulates women. That's not good. But at this time, he's, he's still kind of in with God and he's right with God. What I think that this is telling us is, one, we realize this, the temple was a much larger task much larger than his house. His house is much smaller. I believe that it spoke of the urgency he had for God. Listen, I'm building God's house. All his focus was on building a house for the Lord. But when it came to his house, he took his time. He wasn't in such a rush. He was focused on God. Now, I believe he had a heart for God. And later on, Haggai after, by the way, his temple, Solomon builds his temple and the Babylonians will come and take over the temple and destroy it. And, and Haggai will say this to the people. he say, hey, you've forgotten about God. You're too busy building your own home that you've forgotten about God's house. Listen, Solomon's temple is destroyed. And of course, we know from our Bible that Ezra, Nehemiah, Zechariah, and, and Haggai will, will rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. But do me a favor, real quick. I just want you to read what Haggai said to the people. Turn to Haggai chapter 1. We'll start in verse 2. Haggai 1 verse 2. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying... This people says, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruin? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but bring in a little. You eat and do not have enough. You drink and are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. He who earns wages earns wage to put into a bag with holes. Listen, sometimes we can feel like we can't get ahead. 
It may be, now I'm not saying it is, it may be due to a neglect of God's house. That's what he's saying here. He's saying, listen, folks, you're building up your house. You're building up your house while God's house lay in ruins. You're thinking of yourselves. And so he says, listen, you're, you're earning your wage, but it, looks, it feels like you're putting it in a bag filled with holes. You know, people will often ask me, uh, you know, should I give 10% or should I give more? Is 10% enough? And I say to them, I don't know. <laughs> there's no tithe in the New Testament. After, uh, that is, after Christ ascends, there's no tithe mentioned. But someone will say, but Pastor Randy, doesn't the New Testament ask us to give? And I say, yes, it does. Then Pastor Randy, how much should I give? Well, you want to know the truth? You should give everything. Huh? Yes, listen. 1 Corinthians, write this down or turn to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's which are God's, his ownership, not that you are a God. <laughs> that didn't sound right. <laughs> God wants all of you. He wants your time, your treasure, your talents. And listen, as we give to the Lord and not neglect his house, <laughs> we give what we're going to give joyfully. And sometimes we find ourselves struggling in different areas, because listen, all the things we're putting in that bag for ourselves is that bag's full of holes when we walk selfishly. <laughs> see, here we see Solomon has his priorities right. Remember, he's the wisest man who ever lived. And by the way, because he puts God first, we saw how extravagant he, his offering was for the workers and for the temple. That's why he was so blessed. Richest human being that ever lived. But he made sure that he was giving to the Lord. Now you would say, well, but Pastor Randy, was, isn't that like this pastor here? No, no, it's a completely different beast. Why? Well, because Solomon wasn't lift, living off of people's offerings. He was king. Now, if that guy's king, that'd be a different story. Then it should be something that was passed down and he should be a But as a servant of God, there should be a humility now, there's, I'm not saying, once again, let me say this. And, and the argument for Kenneth Copeland is that, you know, he makes millions off of his book sales. And it's like, maybe he does. But he also, in his books, say, listen, you should give. The more you give, the more you're blessed. And he's buying multi-million dollar jet airplanes. He probably has enough to equal maybe a billion bucks. I don't know. But he has, like, a whole fleet of planes. It's sad. It is sad. Because he's not practicing what he pre preaches, that's for sure. By the way, on the flip side of that, y'all know who Fra Francis Chan is? Okay, you know, he took <laughs> the money that he got from his multi-million dollar book sale and he bought a hospital in a third world country with that money? Oh, look at the difference. <laughs> that's awesome. That's the right heart. And he still lives well. He's not poor. But he lives within his means. Why? Because he'd rather use it to be blessed. But here, Haggai says, listen, you, you work for a wage and you put it in, in pockets that have holes in it. You know, I remember when I was very young in my faith and I was living in Houston, Texas. It was hot and humid, flying cockroaches, lots of rain, <laughs> lots of traffic. All I wanted to do every year was leave. I wanted to leave. I thought, man, I got to get out of this town. I hate the weather. I hate the, the, the mosquitoes that lift dogs and take them away. They're huge. I, I just wanted out. No thought for what does God want from me. No thought. So every year, every year my plan was when I get my tax returns, I'm saving up, and then plus my tax returns, I'm out of Dodge. I'm going back to Cali. I'm glad someone got that reference. <laughs> someone likes LL Cool J. <laughs> 
But I was like, I'm going back to Cali. Wick, wick, wick. God said, wick, wick, wick. I don't think so. Anyways, <laughs> there, that was for your listening pleasure. Okay, so, but every year that was my plan. And then finally, after several years of realizing that I kept putting my money in a pocket full of holes, I'd save up and it'd be gone. I'd save up and it'd be gone. Finally, I gave up and I said, okay, Lord, evidently you want me here. Then God began to use me and bless me when I said, not my will, but thy will. That's where blessings come from, when we don't neglect what God wants of our lives. So how much should we give of ourselves, all of yourself? Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have any time for yourself or any funds for yourself. There there is, but there must be balance, folks. And so that's what what I think we see here in Solomon. He spent seven years. He was focused. Let's get God's house built. But then when he came to his own house, he was kind of like, ah, 13 years. You know, kind of reminds me of Jennifer and I. We take care of God's house better than our own house. Just come over, you'll see. (laughs) But it's He's our life. Is He your life? Is He? Do you have a heart for God, or does He only have a heart for you? Huh. Verse two. He also built the house of the forests of Lebanon. Its length was 100 cubits, that's 150 feet. Its width was 50 cubits, that's 75 feet. And its height was 30 cubits, that's 45 feet. So it's pretty high ceilings. I I like high ceilings, but that's crazy. (laughs) Can you imagine the cooling bill? (laughs) 45 foot ceilings? Okay. With four rows of cedar pillars and cedar beams on the pillars. And it was paneled with cedar above the beams that there were 45 pillars, 15 to a row. Now, interesting here, real quick. um, Notice it calls it, he said, it also built the house of the forest of Lebanon. Some think that this was, that he built a house over in Lebanon. No, I I agree with other commentators. There's kind of a dividing line. I think this was a nickname for this house because of all the beams. Listen, there's there's, uh, uh, 45 beams that are 45 foot tall made of cedar. So walking in there was like walking in the woods of Lebanon. So that's why they called it the house of the forest of Lebanon, because you have all these beams. It wasn't that big a house. I mean, it is big, but when you think 150 feet by 75 feet, and then you've got uh, 45 pillars, uh, that's a lot of pillars. (laughs) So I believe that's what it's really saying. In fact, there's two other references for this house of Lebanon. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 16 and 17. In 1 Kings chapter 10, which we'll get there in a couple of weeks, says, And King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold, 600 shields of gold went to, uh, excuse me, 600 shekels of gold went to each shield. He also made 300 shields of hammered gold, three remained. Uh, uh, minus of gold went into each shield. The king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. So there's that that uh, name of it again. And then, of course, Isaiah 22, 8 says, he removed protection of Judah, and he looked in that day to the armor of the house of the forest. So Isaiah calls this house of the forest of Lebanon, he calls it an armory. <laughs> uh, so it was pretty, pretty uh, cool house, little building, if you will. Verse 4, there were windows with beveled frames on three rows and windows on the opposite windows of three tiers. And all the doorways and doorposts had rectangular frames and the window was opposite the windows of the, in the three tiers. He also made a hall of pillars. Its length was 50 cubits. It's width 30 cubits. And in front of them was a portico with pillars and a canopy was in front of them. He made a hall for the throne, a hall of judgment, where he might judge. It was paneled with cedar from floor to ceiling in the house where he dwelt and the other court inside the hall 
of like workmanship. Now, here's the thing, folks. I read through, I've read through that, I've read through it many times, but today I read through it several times, and I really have a hard time picturing this. I don't know if you do. That's why I think I don't read instructions when I buy things. I'm like, forget the instruction. Let me look at the image on the box. I'll figure it out. <laughs> I think some of you are like me. Thank God for YouTube, right? Anything you want, you can go there and learn, and you've got visual imagery. Here, reading this, I can't picture it very well. <laughs> But anyways, so he, he's giving us a lot of detail as to what Solomon made. Now, I also want you to take note, there's a court for judgment here. So this wasn't just his house. This was also, uh, this would be more like the White House or, or the Capitol Hill. So this is where he lived. It was also where he conducted his kingly duties. Um, don't go there. Solomon also made a house like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had taken as a wife. All these were costly stones cut to size, trimmed with saws inside and out from the foundation of the eaves, also on the outside to the great courtyard. Now, <laughs> he builds a house for his wife. Now, this is good and bad. You say good and bad? Yes. Okay, let me deal with the bad first. Um, I believe a man and woman should dwell together. I really do. I think it's great. You know, he bought her, you know, hey, buys her a house, but he buys her a house for her and he has a house for him. And, and listen, we're going to see the fallout of the badness of this, out of the poor choice in this. Why? Because later on, he will have more and more women, more and more women. I think it is important that two should dwell together. That's the purpose of marriage, to become one flesh. Genesis 2, 24, way back in the beginning. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become what? One flesh. It's amazing to me when I counsel a couple and they have separate rooms. Now, I understand sometimes there are medical reasons. That's different. Or other issues, you know, some, you know, some guys have to have those CPAP or some women, and it's like Darth Vader sleeping with you in the room. <laughs> I can understand you can't sleep. Then I, I get that. But for the most part, there should be one room. What, what also blows me away is when I counsel people and they have separate banking accounts. She has her money and I have my money. No. How is that one flesh? It doesn't work that way. Not good. It's not good. The fact that he built this, someone could say, well, oh, he built a house for his wife. Yeah, but we see the fallout of that later on. It's not good. They should dwell together. They should be one flesh. But he, he has, in all his wisdom, he has a bad habit of not being one flesh. He just is into flesh, period. So you think, well, Pastor Randy, you said there's a good part and a bad part. You told us the bad part. What's the good part? Well, here's the good part. Notice, you're going to notice that Solomon builds a house for God. He built a house for his wife, oh, for himself and his wife. And then he builds a place to conduct his kingly duties. I think that's a good illustration of how our lives should be. God, family, business. It should be in that order. I think too often people get the order out of whack. People sometimes put work, family, God. Okay, work comes first, and then I spend time with my family, and if there is time, then God. Or people go family, work, and then God. No, 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 no. It should be God, family, work. And we see that sample. And once again, here's uh, the wisest man. Verse 10 gives us a good foundation. Speaking of foundation, verse 10. The foundation was of costly stone, large stone. Some 10 cubits, some 8 cubits. Now, remember, a cubit is about 18 inches. So it gives you an idea. About 180 inches on some of these that were 10 cubits. And above were costly stones hewn to size, and cedar wood. 
The great court was enclosed with three rows of hewed stones and a row of cedar beams. So were the inner court of the house of the Lord and the vegetable of uh, veg vestibule of the temple not the vegetables of the lord <laughs> he lacks carrots okay anyways verse 13 but he has <laughs> you know why he likes carrots because carrots allow you to see better he wants to see god <laughs> yeah he likes beans oh <laughs> okay verse 13. Well, never mind verse 13 now king solomon sent and brought huram from tyre he was the son of a widow of the tribe of Naphtali. Now, by the way, his, uh, his mom, obviously a Jew, Naphtali, that's one of the tribes. And his father was a man from Tyre. Tyre would be a pagan or a Gentile nation. So he was half Jew, half Gentile. And his dad was a bronze worker. And he was filled with wisdom and understanding and skill and working with all kinds of bronze work. So he came to King Solomon and did all his work. Now, I love this. I notice um, that we're now talking about the temple again. Remember, he finished the temple, and then it talked about him building a house and a house for his wife and building a court to do, conduct his business. But now we're back to the temple. Why is that? Well, first he built the temple. Now he's furnishing the things that go inside the temple. And we're finding out who did all of this work. Now, real quick, just they are trying to get ready to reconstruct the temple uh, right now in Israel. They've bred the red heifer. They've traced the line of, of um, the, the priestly line. And uh, they also are trying to make all the utensils for what are going to go inside the temple, like the menorah. Now, the problem with the menorah is you've all seen menorahs, right? They're always like sitting on a table and they're this big. No, no, no. The real menorah was probably a little taller than a man. Now, it was made of what? Pure gold. And it could not have anything other than gold in it. So what was happening is they were putting the bulbs and all these, not the bulbs, but it has like budding bulbs on it, you know, looks like flowers. So as they're putting the arms out, what was happening made of pure gold, the weight of the gold, the arms kept coming down. <laughs> so they're trying to figure out how to build it. But this guy and the workmanship that, that Solomon had, he was able to build these things without any problem out of pure gold. Man, they, so when it says he was skilled and the, the workers at, at the temple putting things together, that they were skilled, they really were. Because if in our technology today with computers and, and, and all, the, um, all the experience, still having difficulty building a menorah where the arms don't just start falling. <laughs> so it says, and he cast two pillars of bronze, each one 18 cubits high, and a line of 12 cubits measuring the circumference of each. And he made two capitals on, of cast bronze, and he set them on top of the pillars. And that's, you know, when you see pillars and they have those fancy parts that are kind of go out and connect to the ceiling, that's what the capital means. The weight of one capital was five, uh, excuse me, the height of one capital was five cubits. The weight, the height of the other capital was five cubits. And he made lattice network, with wreaths of chain work for the capital, which were on top of the pillars, seven chains for one capital and seven for the other capital. So he made the pillars two rows of pomegranates above the network of all, and he covered the capitals that were on top, and thus he did for the other capital, the capitals which were on top of the pillars in the hall were the shape of lilies, four cubits. The capital of the two pillars also had pomegranates above by the convex surface, which was next to the networks. And there were 200 such pomegranates in a row on each of the capitals all around. And he set up the pillars by the vest, I can't say that word, of the temple. <laughs> and he set up, now I'm all tongue-tied. I'm not going not to say it. Okay. Uh, and he set up the pillar on the right side and called the name 
uh, Jaquin, and he set up the pillar on the left side and called its name Boaz. Now, he's not calling it Boaz after Ruth and Boaz because we, that hasn't even happened yet. So you think, oh, he's named it after the love story. Everyone loves the Ruth and Boaz story. But no, listen, uh, Jaquin means this, he shall establish. Boaz means this. Now, there are several meanings to the name Boaz. Uh, it can mean in the strength of or in him is strength. It also means swiftly or quickly for something to be done. Now, there is a lot of conjecture as the purpose of these two brass pillars being named. Why would Solomon name them? Some believe that one pillar was to represent the pillar of fire by night, and the other one represented the pillar of cloud by day. Some believe that uh, when someone would come in, they would be saying, that, look, there." There is he shall establish, and there is in his strength, reminding them that it is God who we should uh, focus on, putting their hearts in order before the Lord. The truth is, we really don't know. <laughs> it could be either one of those, it could be both of those, or it could be another reason. Nevertheless, he names these two pillars. Verse 22, the top of the pillars were shaped were in the shape of lilies, so the work of the pillar was finished. And this is interesting right here. This is kind of a weird, uh, we have the, the sea and some oxen that he's going to make. And he made the sea of cast bronze, 10 cubits from one brim to the other. So basically, uh, this thing that looks like the sea is, is a, a 15 foot bronze um, bowl, 15 foot, that's pretty big. It's like a oversized jacuzzi. Um, it's completely round. Its height was uh, five cubits, so it's seven and a half feet tall. And the line of 30 cubits measured its circumference. So 45 cubits, uh, 45 feet in circumference. Below its brim were uh, ornamental buds encircling it all around 10 to a cubit. And all the way around the sea, the ornament of buds were cast in two rows when it was cast. Now, this bowl, by the way, is where the priests would come in and they would do their ceremonial cleansing. And so now look at this. It stood on 12 oxen, three looking to the north, three looking to the west, three looking towards the south, three looking towards the east. The sea was set upon them, and their back parts were pointed inward. So in other words, all of these cows, these oxen were facing out, and there's three on each side facing north, uh, east, west, uh, south, and west. Okay. It was a, a hand's breadth thick. Its brim was shaped like the brim of a cup, like a, a lily blossom. It contained 2,000 baths, and you're like, great. Uh, 2,000 baths would basically be 11,500 gallons of water. This is pretty big. He also made, made 10 carts of bronze. Four cubits was the length of each cart. Four cubits was its width. Three cubits was its height. And this was the design of the carts. It had panels, and the panels were between frames. And on the panels there were, uh, that were between the frames were lions, oxen, and cherubim. And on the frame was a pedestal on top. Both the lions and the oxen were wreathed, painted work. Every cart had four bronze wheels and, and axles of bronze. Its four feet had support, and under the levers were support of cast bronze besides the wreath. Its opening inside the crown at the top was one cubit in di 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 diameter, and the opening was round, shaped like a pedestal, on, and one and a half cubit in the outer diameter. Now, now real quick, I'm, I'm reading through this, and, and it seems kind of dry, and you're going, but remember, this is the Word of God. There's a reason why the, the God has placed this here for us, and, and you'll see here in a moment. And also, the opening of the engravings, but the panels were square, not round. 
Under the panels were four wheels, and the axles of the wheels were joined to the carts, and the height of the wheel was one and a half cubits. So basically, it has 27-inch rims. Forget about your Escalades with its 22-inch rims. We're talking cart with 27. They're, they're really styling now. Uh, you can't buy these. You can't buy rims like these at Discount Tire. I'm sorry you can't. Uh, the workmanship of the wheel was like the workmanship of a chariot wheel. Their axles, their pins, their rims, their spokes, their hubs were all cast of bronze. And, and there were four supports at the four corners of each cart. Its support were a part of the cart itself. And on top of the cart, at the height of, the, uh, at the height of a half a cubit, it was perfectly round, and at the top of the, and on the top of the cart, its flange and its panels were in the same casting. And on the plates of its flange and on the panels, he engraved cherubim, lions, and palm trees. Wherever there was a cedar space on each, with wreaths all around. So it's very decorative these carts. And he made ten carts, and all of them were the same mold, the same measure, the same shape. Then he made 10 levers Hang on. of bronze. Each lever contained 40 baths. Each lever was 40 cubits. On each of the 10 carts was a lever. And he put five carts on the right side of the house and five carts on the left side of the house. And he set the sea on the right side of the house towards the southeast. Now, what is, notice all these things were bronze. Does anyone know what bronze represents in the scripture? Judgment. Thank you, my wife. <laughs> she remember. Yes, bronze. Re remember, remember when all of these snakes were biting the children of Israel? They were being stung and or stung, bitten by poisonous snakes. Uh, remember that they made a brass serpent, and they had to look at the brass serpent. The brass represents judgment. So whenever you see brass in Scripture, remember and keep in mind that that is pointing towards judgment. And so these things are in, uh, these are furnishings for the temple, and these are furnishings that would be used or be um, involved in the sacrifices uh, and for the priest and for all of that so, so that we don't fall under judgment, that we can have our sins atoned for. Of course, when Christ went to the cross, we had our sins completely wiped away forever. So Haram made the levers and the shovels and the bowls, so Haram finished doing all the work that, that he was to do for King Solomon for the house of the Lord. Two pillars, two bowl-shaped capitals on the top, two, two pillars, two networks covering the two bowl-shaped capitals which were on top of the pillars. 400 pomegranates, for the two networks, two rows of pomegranates for each network to cover the two bowl-shaped capitals that were on the top of the pillars, 10 carts, 10 levers on the carts, one sea, 12 oxen under the sea, the pots, the shovels, the bowls, all these articles which Haram made for King Solomon for the house of the Lord were of burnished bronze. In the plains of the Jordan, the king had them cast in clay molds between Sokoth and Zartan. And Solomon did not weigh all the articles because there were so many and the weight of the bronze was not determined. So here's the thing. There was so much bronze being used that they didn't even weigh the bronze. On top of that, think about this. Think about all the gold that was used. Listen, when you're using as much gold as Solomon did, when you come to the bronze, that's like, you know, if you got nothing but $100 bills and then you find pennies, a whole bunch of them, you're like, whatever. You know, you don't count them. So compared to all the gold, and we looked at that last time when we were in chapter 6, at uh, just how expensive and ornate the temple was. So when they came to the bronze, they are just like, look, it's just a lot, okay? It's a lot of bronze. Verse 48. Thus... Solomon had all the furnishings made for the house of the Lord, the altar of gold, the table of gold, which was the showbread. Now, interesting. Notice it says the table of gold, which was the showbread. Uh, do you realize there's actually 10 tables of showbread? Uh, five on each side, but they're considered one unit. 
Uh, in, in fact, in Second Chronicles 4.8, it tells us that there were 10. We know there are 10. But why do they do that? Well, because it's just, it's representing uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. And 12 tribes of Israel are, are considered like one unit. You know, just like we as, as a church, we may be different churches, but we're to be one unit. There can be, you know, 20 churches in this valley, but if all 20 of them are, are consecrated before the Lord, we're all one unit. We're the body of Christ. So I like that, that the showbread here, although there are 10 tables, it's called one table because it's unified. It's a unification. Verse 49. The lamp stands of pure gold, five on the right side, five on the left, on the front in inner sanctuary with flowers on the lamps and the wicker trimmers of gold and the basins, the trimmers, the bowls, the ladles, the, the censers of pure gold and the hinges of gold. Both of the doors of the inner room, which is a uh, most holy place are the holiest holies and the door for the main hall of the temple. The hinges, pure gold. Wow. So all the work that King Solomon had done for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things which his father had dedicated. The silver, the gold, and the furnishings, he put them in the treasury of the house of the Lord. Now, now, did you catch that? David was told by God, you can't build me a temple. But you know what David did? Because his heart was for God. What he did was he supplied gold and silver and furnishings. He, he supplied things for his son to use. He was thinking, he said, listen, I may not be able to be involved with the physical building of the temple, but I can be involved in the support of the building of the temple. You see, David has a heart for God. He's not, he could have said, you know what? I'm just going to hoard all my money. I'm just going to use it for me. I'm going to buy me a couple of jets. <laughs> no. Instead, what he did, because his heart, he's like, God, can I build you a temple? And God said, no, no, your son's going to do it. He says, okay, but you know what I could do? I can help fund it. You know what I love? I love when we have women's retreat or men's retreat. There are some men and women who can't go. But you know what they do? They then support someone who can go. Listen, I might not be able to go, but I can support someone who can go. Sometimes our, our kids go on, on, on retreats, and someone will go, you know, I don't have any kids going, but maybe I can pay for some other kid who, you know, I can support. That's a heart for God. That's the heart for God, and that's the kind of heart David had. He said, listen, I can't build the temple, but I can give some, something for the future. He collected fur, uh, furnishings and treasury and temple, and his son Solomon is the one who built the temple. And even Solomon, do you see Solomon's heart? Do you see all the intricate details? Do you see the extravagance? Now, by the way, David didn't pay for all of it. Solomon paid for a lot of it. And Solomon even got other kings to help pay. He allowed them to be involved in the blessing of doing something for the Lord. I love that. See, that's my heart. I don't always say, hey, you know what? I can do all this. No, no, listen. Sometimes here at HBC, we allow other people, we want other people to serve because when you serve, when you give, when you do this, you partake in the blessing. If, <laughs> if you have a heart for God, you see, there's also, I want to show you the flip side of this coin. There are some people who give, some people who serve, but it's not for out of a heart for God, it's a heart for themselves because they want to impress people. They want people to go, wow, look at all they do. Wow, look at all they give. That's the wrong heart too. But when you have the right heart with God, then what you give and what you do is a blessing. It's refreshing. Solomon, as I read through that, there's a lot of detail. And, you know, it's giving us an overview. There's a lot of detail. It's telling us about the hinges and the door. And we're going to see when we get to chapter 10 that this attention to detail will be why the Queen of Sheba will think that, will know that Solomon has such incredible wisdom. You see, a church... When we do things, like here at HBC, our sound system, our video, you know, we had some problems. We've got a new computer coming tomorrow because we want to give our best 
for the Lord. Maybe it's not as good as some other church, but it's the best that we can do with what we have. But that should be the same, not just for our church. That should be for your life. Do you give the best you can to the Lord? Or do you give God your leftovers? You know, it blows my mind when people give like to Fruits of Harvest. And we saw this before uh, when we had Fruits of Harvest. People would give, hey, I want to bring some donation. And man, basically that stuff should have went to the trash. I don't know who they were giving it to, but they weren't. You know, oh, great. Yeah, give us the stuff. And we go looking through the bag. It's like, this is stuff. You just, you, you treated God's house like a dump. And that breaks my heart. God should not be a dump. And then we get other people who bring in stuff and they go to the other extreme and they bring in brand new stuff. It's still got the tag on it. We're like, wow, what a lavish offering. Where's your heart? See, that's what this is about. Do you see all the details, all the doorposts and the little buds and the pomegranates and the doorposts and all this? It's telling us this, that Solomon was listening to God even in the little details. And when it came to God's house, he was all about it. We'll get this done in seven years because it's for the Lord. And when it came to his house, it's like, you know, we, we'll get it done. I can, it's livable. <laughs> his goal was God his family, and then his kingship where he could sit and rule and judge. What, what are your priorities? You see, that's what this whole thing is about. It's about you and I saying, do we have a heart for God? What is your heart for? Is your heart for accumulating some kind of pious position in the world for people to look at you and go, wow, look at you? Listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest with you. There have been times because up until now, I've been lying. But there, there have been times in my pastorship when I have to stop and say, God, wait a minute. What am I trying to do here? Am I trying to build something up for people to say, oh, look at Pastor Randy and what he's done? Or am I truly going, God, whatever you want. Listen, I have to keep this stark reality. God does not need me. He can remove me and continue to do a greater work without me getting in his way. Or I can get involved and I can have a heart for God and I can give him my best. It may not be as good as your best, but it's the best I have to offer. But the question that I have to ask myself is a question that this scripture today, whether it seemed dry to you or not, the, the, thing, the point is, look at the intricate details in which Solomon gave to the Lord. Look at the, the work that he had done, the detail. Every little thing was important. Down to the little flower petals and the pomegranates. It wasn't a small thing. It was important. Look at how lavish it was. <laughs> Where is your heart for God? To just give him whatever you can spare of your time, your treasure, your talents? You know, one of the biggest obstacles for people and the Lord, my job, <laughs> my job, the job that you have, you wouldn't have it if it wasn't for God. Whatever you have, <laughs> the breath in your lungs is from God. The ability to think, to reason, to work with your hands is from God. We can say, oh, I have a heart for God. <laughs> the proof's in the pudding. Here is Solomon's pudding. <laughs> it's what he did for the temple. Built the temple, then he built his house, and then he's back to working on the furnishings for the temple because it was that important. So yeah, a lot of detail. But what are the details of your life looking like? The details in your life, do they look like this where every little detail is weighed in the balance of God? How many shekels of my life go to God and how many shekels of my life are for Randy? I'll tell you, too many. 
too many. And so I want you to ask yourself tonight and be honest. Because listen, when I'm not honest with me, the only one I'm fooling is me. (laughs) I'm not fooling you and I'm not fooling him. I'm just fooling me. Do you have a heart for God or do you have a religion? Let's pray. Father, I just ask you tonight, Lord, as we looked at this scripture, all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable. Lord, it's profitable that we read this. It is profitable that we examined this. It's profitable that we went through and it's at times seems repetitious and, and we don't understand and we can't picture it, but Lord, we know it's good and it's telling us just how detailed our lives should be when it comes to our relationship with you. Every little detail counts because it's not little to you. If you know the numbers of hairs on our head, then you definitely know the minutes in our day, the seconds. And so, Father, I pray that each one of us would assess who we are and who you are and how we view you Do we put you on the pedestal or is something else on the pedestal of our lives? God, I I ask you to forgive me for those areas that have been dominated by my will, my wants, my flesh. Father, please renew in me a steadfast heart, a devoted heart. And Father, I thank you that you do not grow weary and waiting upon us to get right with you. <laughs> and so, Father, I pray for all my brothers and sisters here tonight that we would focus rightly on what is important in the proper order. God, family, occupation. <laughs> Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing one last.